Dala Tale Provost Chancellor Indigenous Strategy QUT Nugul Enkel Wapabara Nugul Tali Baragan Gabul Nugul Turubu Nyagara. So my name is Angela Barney Leach and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor Indigenous Strategy here at QUT and I recognise that I speak today on the land of the Turubu and Yagara people. So when Chelsea asked me about this, I thought, oh my God, Aboriginal people love social media. I'd love to be able to come and talk about this. And um, then I thought, you know, there's actually probably other people who can talk better on this than me and I'll just sit there and write my million questions down for later on. So, you know, not only do we use it to connect and maintain um, connections with our contact with our family, but we organise huge social events on it. Um, we notify funerals. Um, relationships and on the odd occasion we sometimes use it to slap people down. Um, that's usually over, you know, 300 tweets or four pages on Facebook. <laughs> it's a place where we can show that we are strong in our identity and sovereignty. It's a place where we can represent ourselves and more importantly have control over the messages that we put out. It's also a place, however, that identity can be faked and performed where deliberate misrepresentations are spread. And I'm really interested in hearing what you mob on the stage have to say about that. So today's speakers are active users of social media and they'll share their experience of Indigenous research focused on Indigenous sovereignty, voices, knowledge, experience, and how media and digital approaches can be and have been included in these. So you probably all follow them on media and know social media know that's exactly what they do. If you don't, you should look them up on Twitter. Um, but before I introduce the speakers, I'll just let you know that it's a kind of a free flowing conversation between the mob up there on the stage. And then afterwards, after they finish, we'll take questions from the audience in a kind of a roving speaker kind of Q&A. If you have a statement to make, please turn it into a question. <laughs> because I think we've all heard that before, so some questions would be good. So I've got the bios of the four on the stage and I looked at them and thought, you know, they're, they're kind of long, but I'm actually going to read them all out because they're all really deadly. So the first speaker is Professor Chelsea Wadigo. She's a Malajali and South Sea Islander woman with over 20 years of experience working within Indigenous health as a health worker and researcher Chelsea's work has drawn, on, drawn attention to the role of race in the production of health inequalities. Her current ARC Discovery Grant seeks to build an Indigenous health humanities as a new field of research, one that is committed to the survival of Indigenous people locally and globally and foregrounds Indigenous intellectual sovereignty. She's a prolific writer and public intellectual, having written for Indigenous X, NITV, The Guardian and The Conversation. She is a founding board member of Anala Wangura, Wangura, an Indigenous Community Development Association within her community, a director of the Institute for Collaborative Race Research, and was one of the half, one half of the Wild Black Women. And if you've missed that, that's a problem. You've got to go back and find them and have a listen because they're really funny, but they also talk about um, kind of issues that are happening in their community. Her forthcoming book, um, day in the Colony, another Day in the Colony published by UQ Press is going to be released partly tomorrow and then a big one next week. But for those who know Chelsea know that um, importantly she's a proud mum to five beautiful um, children and you know, just an all round deadly person. So the next speaker is Dr. Jessa Rogers, she's a Rodgery researcher and Indigenous educator with nearly 15 years of experience in schools and tertiary education. Jessa's research focuses on Indigenous research methods and methodologies and Indigenous people's education experiences of education. She was the founding principal of Australia's first boarding school for Indigenous young mothers and babies in far north Queensland. It's a, that's a really important point. You should go and, people should go and have a look at that. It's important that our young mums are supported in their education. She's been, uh, been a Fulbright Scholar a Churchill, at Harvard University, a Churchill Fellow, and awarded the National NAIDOC Award for her contribution. 
to Indigenous girls education. Jess's research draws attention to the voices of Indigenous students, with specific focus on Indigenous boarding schools experience in Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii and mainland USA. She is a mother of three and a board director and is the managing director of Bayai Consulting. Another one you should go and look up. I hope it's all writing these down later on. So the next one is Dr. Melinda Mann, and she's a Durrambul and South Sea Islander consultant, advisor, manager, and educator. And the Wapabara and the Durrambul are real close. <laughs> <laughs> I always call her my cousin. And she might understand some of the words we're saying because the Wapabara and Durrambul speak very similar languages. We used to um, trade and we'd um, marry into each other's groups, so we're probably related somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> probably related to Amy too. Anyway, so Melinda is amazing. She's another one social media. She's worked in higher education, designing, delivering and managing social outreach programs was elected the chair of the Queensland Consortium of Universities for Widening Participation, oversaw student support as a deputy director of student life and wellbeing at CQ University. Her PhD research used Indigenous narr narratology to explore the individual and collective experiences of young people living in her community and their transition to school to family and community roles. Melinda's research has focused on Indigenous people's experience of education but since leaving the higher education sector, which is a, a real pity, but more got to do what they got to do, her priority lies with the Durrambul nation building, South Sea Islander identity and stories and broader Indigenous community development. I feel like I need to clap after these things. <laughs> Next one here is Amy Maguire. She's also Durrambul, so if, um, so <laughs> I was thinking, oh, not my cousin or my niece or something, we could be related too. So she's Durrambul and South Sea Islander journalist and writer from Rockhampton, sent from central Queensland. She has spent the past 15 years working in the Aboriginal independent media, focusing on issues of justice, violence and land rights. Now, she, she brings up really important issues if you follow her on Twitter around social justice and around incarceration. And it's just something that people should really follow because it's right on point for a lot of what the community is thinking. She was previously the editor of the National Indigenous Times and Tracker magazine and co-host of the Let's Talk program on 98.9 FM in Brisbane. She's also the co-host of Investigate podcast, Curtain, which aims to exonerate wrongfully convicted Aboriginal man, Kevin Henry, who was incarcerated for 29 years for a crime he did not commit. She's done a, a quite a bit of work on that and that's just, yeah. think about that. Um, when they're talking about how really important issues and issues of misjustice can be brought up through social media. Actually, maybe I should sit, should sit on the stage there. Anyway, her work has appeared in BuzzFeed, The Guardian, New York Times, The Washington Post, Vogue Australia and Marie Claire. In 2021, she wrote her first children's book, Daybreak, and her first non-fiction book, Black Witnessed, which is due to be published in 2022 by UQP. She is currently undertaking a PhD in media representations of violence against Aboriginal women. So I think we might just give them a round of applause before we start. And I think, so now I might hand it over to the panel to just um, start our conversation. We're going to go with that mics today. Um, so we'll throw it open um, to the amazing deadly women on the stage. Let's talk about Blackfella Twitter. And I think it'd be nice to hear what brings us to this space as Aboriginal uh, women and what you see as the purposes um, that we engage in that space so frequently. So open up the arm with that. Well, I think um, it's probably important to point out that Blackfella Twitter emerged because we, people know about Black Twitter. Um, and we'd be participating in conversations um, and um, as black fellas, we are both uh, black and indigenous. And so sometimes the messages got lost in translation. Um, there was a violence sometimes in that, in that engagement between black Twitter and black fella Twitter. And so um, it was very important to mark out a space that was distinctly black 
from this place um, that didn't erase our blackness, um, but also asserted our indigenousness here. Um, and so there is a hashtag called Blackfella Twitter um, that we use to um, mark out the kind of conversations we're having online um, to connect with. So we may connect with Black Lives Matter at the same time, we'll hashtag Blackfella Twitter to make sure that people are un understanding that because I don't think a week goes by where we might have somebody question um, whether even black people exist here, um, which we've all had those debates um, internationally. Um, so it was very important um, that we mark out our space online to say this is, this is a conversation that involves us. Um, sometimes people don't get the memo that it doesn't involve them, um, but it's our way of guess, asserting our, our space of that this is our conversation to be having. So it's a hashtag worth checking out. It's definitely, um, you've articulated it well and I love you know, Blackfellow Twitter used to be a marker of this is a black space, so that's engage. Um, and I think that's the benefit of Twitter. We have our own community um, of a whole, a whole range of different ind Indigenous peoples from Australia that are engaging in that space. And it used to kind of, I felt that hashtag was a marker of this is a space where we want to discuss something amongst ourselves. And if um, non-Indigenous people wanted to kind of sit back and watch and engage from that space, it would be okay. Unfortunately, even um, that hashtag is now no longer a marker for people to be like, okay, maybe I should just sit back and watch if I'm not engaged. And so people are actually like, black follow Twitter only. And that's where people start to have those safe conversations. But I think for me, um, one of the things Angela mentioned in the opening was this idea of an online persona. And it kind of connects for me with the um, indigenous research that we're kind of all involved in and how it's underpinned by that relatedness. I think that was beautifully demonstrated with that opening of, you know, maybe we could be cousins, maybe we could be family. Um, that kind of relational um, engagement is what we're operating within on Blackfellow Twitter. But I don't think that um, understanding necessarily translates sometimes to a white audience. That's something I'm quite interested in exploring a little bit more. Yeah. But I think also, I think it's important to remember that Blackfellow Twitter is really funny. Um, and I think about, I think Melinda is the star of Blackfella Twitter when it comes to Blackfella humour. I don't know if you want to talk to that in terms of describing what Blackfella Twitter is beyond the issues yeah. we discuss. I think like for Blackfella Twitter, it's like you said, Charles, it carves out a space for us to have our own yarns and things that are important to us. And so part of that means that we know that people who engage in that space, they also have like a shared understanding of what, like the context and some, I guess, some assumed knowledge that if you've grown up black, you understand something. So humour then just makes it, you know, we just kind of connect through that. And, you know, and other ways too, it's just, you know, the humour and I think the sharing of ideas and opinions and it makes for, you know, some really interesting conversations. But, you know, humour, I think, is one of the things that I love about Twitter. And as much as Twitter gets bagged out by other people, especially I think in non-Indigenous, you know, people are always talking about the toxic, um, the toxic experiences they have. But we protect ourselves, I think, because that's not, you know, the reality is the real, real life, the real world is the toxic place for us, okay. not social media. Mm -hmm. And so we do that by actually, you know, exerting or exercising our sovereignty everywhere, including on Twitter to do what we want to do. And, and humour is something that we see, it's, it's a beautiful part of how we engage online. Um, from a media perspective, because I started in media around 2006, and the time I started, and a lot of people would remember it, there were very few Aboriginal voices ever allowed in the mainstream media. So it was very much um, Aboriginal voices who are most palatable to white people and white policies and who are going to pave the way for this, you know, really neoliberal turn of Indigenous policy. So it's pretty much like five black voices and no one ever, ever you know, got a say in anything. So, you know, I was just thinking about because I think a lot has changed in relation to that. Like we see a lot, um, you know, of black fellow voices from different community, different political perspectives. And I think that's tied directly to the emergence of social media and particularly Twitter. Um, and it shouldn't have had to come to that. Like I think mainstream media are fundamentally lazy. Um, so we've actually had to forge our own um, social media presence, not so much to get recognition in mainstream media, but to build our own sovereign black media space. 
And so I see that as a key contributor in relation to Twitter. And there's all these debates and, you know, people like Lee Sales and, you know, um, Lisa Miller, they talk about it being toxic and everything like that. But I see key benefits for the for the people who have been most let down by the media. And for us, it's a way to um, assert accountability and build an expression of our sovereignty through social media. And I think there's very limited debates around mainstream media and these high profile, um, you know, white journalists who don't see it as that. They don't see it the way we see it as mainstream media has been a key part of the oppressive colonial state, which is what it is. You know what I mean? It's an arm of that. They can't see outside of that. So I see Twitter and Blackfella Twitter and the way Blackfellas use social media, particularly Facebook as well, as ways to fight against that. And so the conversation that mainstream media have around social media is so fundamentally different to the conversations even we're having right now or way the, around the way blackfellas are using social media and particularly Twitter. And I think, you know, blackfellas are really organised in terms of blackfella Twitter. Um, and you'll see it's not just about random tweets or threads. Um, they're, you know, in terms of commentators who are having their work published and, and being shared. Um, and blackfella Twitter does a lot of heavy lifting on a range of issues that aren't distinctly Indigenous and never, never gets acknowledged for it. And so you see the counts that, that get recognition for calling out stuff and, it, and you'll find that often the source is blackfella Twitter, um, that the most courageous critique comes from blackfella Twitter because we see this, this unmitigated blackness, this exercising of Indigenous sovereignty in online spaces because we have to do it um, in real life all the time. And so I think one of the things that frustrates me is oftentimes, um, you know, we have these accounts that have maybe 2,000 followers who are really leading the charge in terms of critical commentary and, and being the first ones to, to make these calls, often not getting recognised for the intellectual and political work that they're doing online, much like in real life. Um, the erasure of black presence is everywhere. Um, but we're still here. Mm -hmm. And that use of social media, um, the online space and the real life space, I think something Chelsea's kind of talked about and it's really impacted me is the impact that um, living in both those worlds and the, the kind of burden that our bodies actually bear when you speak out publicly on social media about issues and um, you do cop the flack that is also in real life. So already as black women, as black mothers, as people trying to exist within the academy, which is by nature um, quite a violent space for Aboriginal people, when you move into that online space and do open yourself up to you know, Twitter, which is if you've got an open account, anyone in the world can see what you're saying and come back at you for it. Um, that, that weight of that is so, um, it is something that we live with. It is something that we choose to be a part of, but it's also, I feel, um, obviously with the benefits, but we can't uh, discount the, yeah, the weight of that and what that means to move within those spaces because some of the accounts on Twitter have no faces, no names, and we are living individuals with relationships with communities and people. And we've, um, in our research spaces, we work with communities and we do represent all of those people. And I think when you actually speak from a sovereign point of view, you naturally are seen as a liability to your employer, um, to the Western world that we have to function within because what we say is not palatable. And then from that space, you have to move into your professional spaces and um, the other spaces bearing that um, and knowing that you've taken those risks and it's worth it. But um, it's something that not a lot of people understand. So I think it's important to talk about. Well, it's a clear difference between black Twitter and black fella Twitter. So in terms of being black and indigenous, um, uh, there isn't really engagement with black fella Twitter or for accounts that are anonymous. Um, you have to say who, you can't just put the red, yellow, black in there. You have to say who your mob is and where you come from. Um, whereas there are so many, you know, Twitter accounts where people are anonymous. Um, but there is this kind of rule, at least will I enforce it, um, that I don't, I don't talk cultural business or political business with Indigenous accounts that are anonymous. I want to know who I'm talking to because we are relational people. So whereas black Twitter, anyone, there could be anyone behind that account, black fella Twitter, no, you, you are known. Um, and, and we will ask, who is that account? Who is who's behind that? Um, and there is a requirement to identify yourself. So you don't get the, the protection of an anonymity that other Twitter users do, because we are still maintaining our protocol in terms of these online spaces. Um, well, not everyone, but um, <laughs> we'll call someone's cousin <laughs> about them. Um, so there is this sense that um, you can't hide. You, we have to explain our relationship to each other. And, um, and oftentimes we are finding family on Blackfella Twitter. Um, 
And so it's, it is unique in that sense. And that, that comes at a, at, a, at a cost then for um, black fellas in terms of speaking courageously and being known and your employer being known. And I can tweet about something that has nothing to do with my work and, and no doubt the Dean will be called. Um, such as the violence of the colony for black fellas who dare speak freely in this place about this place. Mm. I think that uh, you know, transparency is really key in the way that we, we use black fella Twitter. Um, like Chell said that, you know, we have to position ourselves all the time in our, in our relationships in the, you know, real world. But, but, you know, Twitter is the real world too, because we are engaging with other mob and we are, there are protocols that we have to abide by that others may not have to abide by or don't abide by. And so positioning ourselves and, and saying who we are and which mob you're from and where you grew up and what your lived experience is, is part of having that really you know, a, a, a conversation that is grounded in integrity. Um, and I think that's really important in the way that um, we get to use Twitter to have really meaningful, you know, conversations about a whole range of things that can be the funny stuff, but also, you know, the work that, that, Hayley, um, that Amy does. I'm gonna call you Hayley, your sister. She'll, she'll rouse on me, but um, yes, that Amy, you know, you know around incarceration and, and deaths in custody. Because you have to know, you know, you have to come to, to Twitter with, yeah, you know, kind of, as Chell says, running straight. You've got to know, you know, you've got to back yourself um, if you're going to make claims. Um, because we do a lot of checking you know, behind and, and we, the conversations can change if we check to see who someone is and it's a particular person and we've got to understand their context and that relationship. Those, those, we change the way that we engage with that person. Or we might, you know, it might be that we have to check them as well. So it's, um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in DMs and group chats as well. So <laughs> just to make sure we know who we're, who we're talking, what we're talking about. And do you let that one go? Because, you know, like it's, exactly. yeah, there's a whole lot of yeah. things that go on behind the scenes around um, negotiating that. And that's why Blackfellas Twitter is highly organised because we're connected and, and, and so, if you watch it from a distance, you may not understand all the, the workings behind the scenes in terms of what goes on. Um, and, and it's the personal, it's community, it's cultural, it's political, it's intellectual. Like there's all these kinds of things happening at any one time. Um, you know, if someone gets called out, um, you see Blackfella Twitter move to back mob. Um, I love the power of Blackfella Twitter. Um, if someone comes for our people, you know, we're going in. Um, and so I just love the way in which the, the solidarity of black fellas on social media. We hear all the negativity, but there is a whole lot of solidarity that goes on to protect our mob from, from some of the stuff that they must be subjected to. Yeah, for sure. And I want to move into the research space just because all of the people on the stage here have their own experiences. And I think um, I've been working with Melinda on a project at the moment around sovereignty and education and um, we've, sh we've shared some yarns around what it meant to be um, for Melinda, an Indigenous person that's actually living on her own country, working with her own people and I guess I, I see so many links between what we're talking about around the relational, the protocols, working with um, Indigenous peoples in our research space and obviously Indigenous research is popular. Um, not just the people on the stage, obviously everyone wants a piece of these amazing women, but um, people are interested in Indigenous research and Indigenous research methodologies. Um, and I would love to hear from everybody their experiences of what it means to work in that space. And um, I think we're at kind of a precipice as well because we've had this period of time where people have come to know the work like decolonising methodologies and kind of the work that's existed in that space. And now, what does it mean to move past like yarning, which is becoming almost a buzzword. And I hate to see that because this stuff we're talking about, the relational stuff is lost when you just turn focus groups into yarning circles. So i um, love to hear your thoughts. Well, I, you know, I, I stepped away from university life um, last year and it's been wonderful to do that, <laughs> I should just add. Um, yeah, exactly. But, uh, you know, I think, you know, research for me and, and the reason that I went into PhD research in the, at the beginning um, was really just because, um, you know, I was interested in not in teaching or not in, um, in further like having a research career, but in building Durrumbul Nation. And that has always been like the key um, driving force that's been behind like all of the work that I've done. And I think 
Um, I remember having a conversation with a Torres Strait Islander elder in the community one time, and I'd been home from Rocky, back to Rocky about five years after living, you know, living down here. And, um, and when she saw me come out of this meeting that we'd been in, and she was like, oh, Bob, you've moved home. And I said, oh, honey, I've been home for like five years now. She's like, well, where have you been? And I said, I've been at university. I worked there. And she's like, oh, you, you came home, but you haven't come home. And so like at that point, I knew that I had to move away from the university because the work that needed to be done wasn't in the academy. The work is with Durrambul Nation and with building really strong community controlled organisations in a regional town. And for me, that's, you know, that whole frame of living in a region, living in a, a city like Rockhampton with the people who have come to live there since colonisation. I think, you know, that for me is the driving force behind, you know, where I w even want to put my energy. Um, and I think, you know, that's Twitter and Facebook. It allows you to see people for where they are and it allows you to kind of make a determination of whether that person is someone you can invest your time in because you can see that if they're, if they, you know, if they're silent on, on issues, then you don't need to waste your time on the, that, those things because everyone has a presence on social, well, people that we know who are, uh, you know, having, um, you know, using social media quite a lot, but are being silent on issues that matter to us. It just saves a whole heap of time trying to figure out whether you want to work with them or not. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that's, and you know, we only have a limited time. So it's, you know, Twitter and Facebook in particular in, you know, in regional areas and with family and community, that's where that stuff happens on Facebook. Facebook is another beast when it comes to black followers. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, but I think for me, research is about building nations, um, nations of, um, you know, for Durrambul people building our nation. So when, we can't, when we're talking about yarns, it's strategic. It's about getting our land back. It's about getting our seas back. So it's not just sitting around having a yarn. And those discussions can happen on Facebook too. I just wanted to add onto that because it's so similar to when I moved back to Rocky. So I was gone for about 11 or 12 years and then come back half to raise my daughter because she was only one, but the other half is because I was doing Kevin Henry's case. But I didn't, I never thought I would live back on Durumbal country again. But when I was there and I started the PhD, I realized I had to be on Durumbal country because there were things that were happening that wouldn't have happened if I had stayed here in Brisbane. And there were ways the stories and the work I was doing was speaking to me in signs. And I used to think they were like strange coincidences. I was calling them like Chelsea knows, but they were just weird signs. And I realized they're the ancestors talking to me and they're the ways I'm not there to find out or take ownership of this knowledge. It's actually coming to me in signs. And it was around these two stories. One of them was Kevin Henry. And then the other one has been Queenie Hart, who were hopefully um, she died in Rockhampton 1975 at the hands of a white man who killed her. The white man was just let go even though there was all evidence. And when I looked into the case and there was all these signs pulling me to the case, um, I realised that um, what, what is justice here? Because that white man's dead. What is justice here? I realised justice was in bringing Queenie back home to Sherberg because at the time the protector had denied her family the right to take her home for no reason other than to be assholes basically. And so I realized, oh, there was this reason this story is calling me. And there were ways that sort of informing my research around looking at presencing as a methodology and ways we tell stories of um, cases of victims of violence and ways we are responsible and we have relationships um, with the communities and the women and the people we're writing about. And I don't think I could have had that if I had not been on Durumbal country, working in Durumbal country, because it was the country that was speaking. And that's why I say there's, you know, these stories happen, this violence happened, but the, particularly the river Tunabar remembers. And there were ways they dredged up those. And it sounds like crazy to people, but it's so true because it's real, like it happened. Mm -hmm. And it happened in all these strange signs that are just crazy to be coincidences. You know what I mean? But it was going through, back through Durumbal country and researching on Durumbal country that that happened to me. And it was not, and it was just hearing the signs and listening and realizing this is what has to happen. Those kind of signs are, I think, one of the um, first markers when I started my PhD. I just felt completely overwhelmed and uncomfortable because I too had returned to Canberra where I was born on Ngunnawal country to kind of connect with that part of my life. And I was just reading all of this literature that my PhD supervisors at the time had given me that was very much 
trying to direct me towards anthropology and ethnography because I'd gone there to tell the stories of girls in boarding schools after my experiences working with Indigenous girls in boarding schools um, and finding there was a lot of issues that were not being spoken about. And then I came across Indigenous research methods and methodologies and way past the practicalities of what a yarn might look like. There was information around when you come to the data um, as an Indigenous person and sit with that, some of the themes will actually come to you in dreams, signs and things that have been a part of my life before the research. And then I started to see Indigenous research allowed a space for me as an Aboriginal person to actually engage in research in a meaningful way, which up until that point I hadn't felt it was meaningful, even though the stories um, were there. I kept just thinking Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous stories exist way outside of the academy, so why do I need to do a PhD? Um, indigenous knowledges have been shared, taught, understood in ways that had nothing to do with these Western kind of things that were being pushed onto me. And I think at that point, that was when I fell in love with Indigenous research, because those signs and those moments when things just come together, the person arrives, you, you arrive at a, a place at the right time, or um, you see something that's exactly related to something you've been grappling with, a dream happens, and you just know there's a flow, there's a spirit that um, and I, I get goosebumps even thinking about it. It just happens. And I think, um, yeah, for me, that's, that's the part that uh, makes me passionate about Indigenous research. And that is not something that can be replicated by, I believe, non-Indigenous researchers um, that come to the methods that we're describing, like yarning and trying to fit it into an 8,000 word journal article. Um, these conversations don't happen. And these are the kind of spaces that I think we exist in. Um, and that we discuss as Indigenous researchers, but um, maybe aren't articulated or actually read by uh, non-Indigenous people. And I think um, <clears throat> over the years, have, social media has been very much a part of the study design from the from the get-go. Um, we talk about um, knowledge translation, and certainly Lowich Institute has really led that charge of requiring you know Indigenous research to build a knowledge translation from the get-go, as rather than an afterthought, and not think about the conference paper and the publication and the policy brief. Um, and so over the years, we've done built into the, their approach things like vodcasts, podcasts. Um, I, as, a, as an academic, I share what I'm reading all the time. I might do a highlighted passage and I use Twitter, um, Instagram and Facebook. And, you know, Facebook is blacker than blackfella Twitter. It's the blackest I, ever because you, you can't be anonymous at all. You have to have friends. You don't have fans or followers. You have friends and family who drag you. So... Um, <laughs> I like to use Insta and Facebook to share thinking with Mob. I'm reading this and, and just to think out loud. And sometimes I use Twitter for that, but sometimes I don't think Twitter's the place for it because I want to have the yarn with Mob more. Um, so I, as an academic, I use uh, social media in all kinds of ways to connect, not disconnect, um, but also show the workings and show the thinking. Um, as academics, we're trained to know, to claim. Um, as black fellas, we're trained to share. Um, and to know the limitations of our knowing. And so um, it can be scary to think out loud online because um, there's a price to be paid for that. Um, but I think it's a really healthy way to be as an academic, um, to think about knowledge in a different kind of way, to think relationally and to think about something that is shared, um, that we can't possess it and own it and, and it's not just ours. Um, and, and to be that have that as part of the process. Um, so I, I love some of the things that the works we've been able to create um, that I can share a vodcast about a Nala man talking about black masculinity and the people who are in it share it and, and are proud of their story. They, I don't have to refer them to a peer reviewed journal publication, though I can. Um, but there is also an op-ed piece that is accessible. There is the vodcast, which is them telling their story as, that's, as it stands. Um, and, I, and for me, that's about accountability to our community that um, we're not claiming to own, we're sharing and amplifying our knowledge, our stories in all different kinds of ways. And Blackfellas are using social media in really interesting ways. And I think it's an exciting place to be as an academic, to think about, I mean, because the only people reading journals are academics. Uh, no one else. Um, so what's the point of the knowledge then, if it's only for us? Um, it has to be of service, has to have a function for the people who are, who are working for. Um, and social media offers that accountability. And, and um, I like that I have that. I like that someone will say, nah, or have the conversation. That's, that's, that's how we've been raised in terms of um, when we do claim to know something or to speak for something, we are all held accountable. And so 
There's, I find it interesting encountering non-Indigenous academics who get subject to critique, who then frame us as being the aggressors, who frame us as being the violent ones, as the risk and the threat, when we are speaking in defence of our own people, um, who are experiencing the violence of the ideas that they are perpetrating and rationalising as though it's some sort of um, um, in authoritative way. And I think that's the conversation we need to have in the academy about the, the right of black academics to engage intellectually with the work in the academy without the risk of losing our jobs, without being denied opportunities to collaborate in teams, without being demonised and pathologised as, as violent um, blackfellas. Um, and so, and I think we haven't had that conversation yet. And it's one that I'm constantly coming up against of assuring people that I'm a good person, I'm a good academic, I'm just being a good black fella, because that's what my community have called me to, me to do. And, and I'm held accountable in the same way that I will hold others accountable to that knowledge, in a good way. Universities are really, um, obviously on this journey of trying to include Indigenous voices and they've all got fancy wraps and employment plans and you know aims of Indigenous in increasing Indigenous academics. But I think what you're talking about is one of the barriers to why they actually take the steps to do that because there is um, a loss of power, I think, when you engage with Indigenous people, engage with Aboriginal people, we're running on another track because for us, we're working towards our community's goals. We're working to be good Aboriginal people. We're working towards keeping our good relations. And yes, universities, yes, you know, increasing our publications and doing all the things that great academics do. But we have another purpose as well. I think sometimes that can be really confronting um, the universities I've worked in across Australia have always grappled with how to almost control the Indigenous academics that are too loud. And I think that probably might be the same in the media because when our voices are actually heard, some of the messages aren't very palatable for a white audience. Um, and at the end of the day, I know I, I actually don't care about that. So I think that's part of um, the resistance and the internal resistance that you see in universities to actually take the real steps, not just say they're going to do it, but actually do it. Increasing Indigenous numbers of academics, increasing Indigenous knowledges in ways that are meaningful, taught by Indigenous peoples and so on. And accepting that, you know, it, it's not enough to just um, accessorise an institution with um, ancestry, because what, what sovereign blackfellas are bringing to the academy is the criticality that's so desperately needed and a way of thinking about um, each of the disciplines in ways that few others do. And so there's an opportunity to, 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 to be a different way, to think differently. And I always got, I'd always get surprised at, in working in academic institutions, the lack of appetite for engaging in different ideas because I genuinely thought this is the place that you can do that. Um, that was the classrooms that I went as an undergrad, but I was in a predominantly Indigenous class. So we debated ideas all the time and it was just a given. And then we'd all go downstairs and have a smoke afterwards and laugh about the debates we had. Um, not encouraging smoking, but just saying. Um, <laughs> but you know, so I had that environment. I had it at the kitchen table where we were encouraged to, d to argue and debate. Um, and so then, becoming a grown academic and entering spaces and where I may express a different viewpoint or write a critique of something, I was shocked to find that that was not actually valued um, or that was seen as a threat. And I, I, I thought that's, there was an appetite here for that. And um, I realised that, that only certain people are allowed to engage in, in debating ideas um, and that we need to be conscious of the function of these places and that Black fellas aren't, I've yet to meet an Indigenous HDR student who has come to do a research project to uphold the discipline that they were trained in. They've come with an agenda to um, emancipate our people in some kind of way and part of that emancipation lies in dismantling the discipline that they were trained in. Um, and so to recognise, for the institutions to see academic excellence, there has to be a preparedness to recognise um, how both limited and violent the knowledges that are produced here about black fellas are. Um, and get out of the way so that black fellas can do the intellectual and political work that we've been called by our communities to do. <laughs> just saying, just saying. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, I thought universities were about that as well until I, <laughs> until I started doing my PhD research. I didn't, yeah, but I mean, I didn't grow up having that as a vision of where I would aspire to. And I think even like talking my dad, my dad didn't even know really what a PhD was. Like, I think Melinda, you're like one of the only mob in. Yeah, but 
So I didn't really have a good understanding, but just in relation to the media space, um, like there's all these talks around, I think it's very similar, that there's always talks around diversity in mainstream media and getting more black faces in on the TV, but also in editorial roles. And I just always thought, because when you were just talking, I just have always felt lucky because I've always been in Aboriginal and independent media. So I've never felt like I could be constrained. And in fact, it was sort of a training ground to actually think more. I guess like more of my thinking has been done in media, but because it's been a sovereign black media space. So for me, it's always been about actually building capacity in independent black media rather than working in the confines of mainstream media. So it was very different coming into the academy and seeing the way mob were treated, um, particularly, you know, people I really respect and whose thinking has really informed mine, seeing how they've been treated, you know, that was actually quite a shock to me because I hadn't realised. But now, obviously, I know, you know, the academy is just another colonial institution, you know what I mean? So it's about the work we're doing in these spaces to negotiate around that and build a collective, which is what Chelsea is doing at the moment, to be able to look at race and racism and racial violence within these structures while also contesting it as well. So it was actually a learning experience for me coming into the academy because I assumed that was what they were for as well. But I assumed, yeah, quickly found out that that wasn't always what they were for. But I was lucky to find an intellectual community where I can do that. Like, I've just been lucky, I think, more so than anything. But it's interesting, I think, in, in higher ed and I think even in the, in the media space, the, the black space and community organisations, the, the black community controlled sector, the black, black media, um, the black unit on campus, they're always seen as these enclaves of like substandard, subpar, um, but the, uh, these are the sites of excellence, um, the sites of innovation. Um, these, are, this is where the beautiful work happens, the different, the courageous work happens. Um, and, it, and it's a really um, sad time for me in terms of this indigenising moment in higher ed where, I'm not talking about this institution, but certainly more broadly at the national level, there's been a push towards a mainstreaming as somehow a marker of success. If that we have an Indigenous person spread across the whole organisation and we do away with Indigenous units and, and spaces, that somehow we've made it as a nation and we've transcended race. That strategy is really violent for us. Um, there is power in black collectives um, and there's excellence in the black enclave. Um, it's why we live and work in the various communities that we live and work in physically, intellectually and politically. And, um, and that's, I mean, certainly with um, social media and Blackfella Twitter, that's we've, we've um, found the power in, in the black collective and online spaces. Um, and you just see the, the, the it's, it's clever blackfella Twitter. It's a, it's a really funny, clever place to be in. And one week it's karaoke and next minute it's campaigning for deaths in custody. And you know, the, just the range um, and the labor and, and the thinking that goes on in that space and the sharing of knowledge. Um, it, it's, yeah, black spaces are great spaces to be in, just saying. It just reminds me of how, um, I guess, you know, universities are so much like high schools in the way that black students are treated and how we, you know, just the, the expectation to comply constantly. And it's, you know, so our children go through this stuff and, you know, as, all, as mothers, you know, we, we see that, we experience that with our children who are coming from home from school and experiencing the same things that we're experiencing at work because we are, we dare to be, you know, black people within an education system or institution. Um, but, you know, unlike our children who have, you know, it's kind of compulsory for them to be at school, it's not compulsory for us. And so we see a lot of, you know, uh, mob walk away from universities with PhDs and with experience and with the lots of knowledge and, and just saying, you know, we just, we just want to be in our communities doing the work that needs to be done to be the ancestors that we need to be for our mob and not be defined by, um, yeah, well, I guess that, you know, how compliant we, we would like to be or they would like us to be. So, um, but that also means that for the mob who stay at universities, like, I think that's why, you know, Blackfellas, Blackfellas Twitter is so important for me is because I get to still you know, um, jump in if there's a if there's something that's happening with you know a mob who are still within the academy and doing um, doing so much intellectual work um, that we get to benefit from. And I think you know that that needs to feed each other. That activism needs to feel, feed scholarship, and scholarship has to feed activism. It's you know it's one and the same thing.
Well, if that's it for our yarn, we could probably start with some questions if we've got time. I don't know how we're going for time. Oh, 118. Is that good? It's not going to be sitting at home. <laughs> <laughs> talking, talking that's to good. I'm talking about some of these, these issues. Okay, so now we're going to move into um, some Q&A um, session right now. Does anyone want to start off with a question? Yeah, um, now that you're mentioning that intersection between our social media space and academics, how do you think academics can like meaningfully acknowledge community and like that that relationship and how can we like bridge that pathway um, and make it more normalised perhaps um, and recognised for non-Indigenous academics within the space as well? Um, one tip is don't block black fellows who critique your work. Be accountable. Like it happens, um, you know, as a black fellow who contributes to public discourse as an academic, um, and I, you know, it's Twitter. It's like the critique is there, it's, and it's and it's it's research. It's thought through, um, and what I see is, and we see it with journalists as well. Um, you'll have mainstream journalists will just block the critique, particularly from black fellows, because they don't want to hear it. Um, if we're going to have meaningful engagement, it means accountability, and it means learning how to. Um, make things right when you do things wrong. We've all had to learn it. It's painful, but it's, it's less painful if you do it quickly and you do it properly. Um, so it's about being, a, meaningful relationships means being accountable. Um, and so um, being open to being answerable to other people who aren't your employers, um, who you don't have to be accountable to, but you will be because ethically, you know that's the right thing to do. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest challenges online is the way in which blackfellas get silenced and erased who are making really important commentaries knowledge. while extracting at the same time. As well, yeah, I don't know if you wanted to add to that. But I think that's one of the key parts as well as, you know, research is just looking at mob as, you know, knowledge to be extracted from. You know, I was just like, just been thinking a lot more in the context of media and everything, but like in breaking stories and discovering stories. And I was just thinking, you know, stories aren't there just to be discovered or taken ownership of, they're just still there. And I feel that's the same for, for research. You know, they're so quick to try and extract knowledge and put their names on it. So I think it has to understand Indigenous research is very different in that we don't own that knowledge. It's coming from a very different place. And it, again, relationships, reciprocity, there's all these other tenets that you have to pay attention to, but knowing that you don't actually own it. You know yeah, what I mean? And I think that's a very different way of seeing research between Indigenous and non-Indigenous researchers is why it's led to such a, you know, violent, you know, history as you would know um, in relation to the, how the academy has treated black communities and why there's so much, um, you know, um, oh, what's the word like, yeah, there's just like that broken relationships between black communities and, and the academy, I think. Yeah, I think, and also if you're, in, when you, you know, in writing in your academic work, if you, happen to know something that didn't come from a journal but you know that it came, knew that it came from someone on Blackfella Twitter or somewhere else you have to cite mm -hmm. black women and that's that's a whole thing that's a whole other show <laughs> but you know like I think that's really important and, and it gets you know you can see that like um, when people are sharing and we share so freely so generously um, and so those ideas can be taken, they can be, you know, and maybe not stolen completely, but, but there's, you know, there's a bit of theft in that. Um, so citing, you know, citing the people that you, 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 you know, where you get that from, that information, because if you didn't come up with it, then it's, then it's not yours. And so that's, you know, that goes for everyone as well, like citing, citing the people who, you know, you, um, you build your knowledge from. And I mean, we saw recently, I hope you don't mind me mention this, Amy, but there was um, uh, a journalist who wrote an article on Aunty Queenie um, recently and wrote about her coming home, but managed to not mention Amy once at all in the whole story. Um, and it, it was Amy's article in the GoFundMe that got within 24 hours the money to get her home. Now that journalist knew, knows Amy That's exists and knows her work. And, it, and at the bottom, on the bottom, they, they claimed ownership. So they yeah. said uh, and named themselves and the other journalists as discovering the story. So this, this, discovery this, this discovery doctrine. Because <laughs> I mean, Queenie's story was Queenie's story and Absolutely. Queenie's community's story, but it was just such a different way of, 
you know, thinking of that. Yeah. So that yeah. It's not people not knowing what the source of the, the knowledge that they're claiming. There is a violence in erasing the, the work of black fellows in online spaces and academics and journalists are all complicit in that work. Um, and yet, when we dare speak back, get blocked. Yeah. Um, and we well, all got to be accountable to the people that we speak of, all of us. Um, it doesn't matter if they're black fellows or not. Mm. It's kind of like when people won't retweet you, but they just take your information and put it in their own tweet. Mm. <laughs> it's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Question at the back. Well, I, thanks very much for that. It's really amazing. Um, Amy, I wanted to ask you a question about Kirby. It's like listening to you. Oh, true. Yeah, it's amazing. And really harrowing at mm. the same time. But I wanted to ask you about, did you find that there was resistance trying to get that information or extract that information? through the systems? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely from the court system. Um, not so much in that we had all the trial transcripts and everything like that. So it was again one of those things where the story was and the truth was lying out there in plain sight. It was more about what the questions you had to ask. So that's why I started to thinking of, because um, my co-host Martin is a lawyer and has worked on many cases overseas. He's just been working on Rodney Reed and a few of really high, he worked on Amanda Knox and Peter Grester and all those cases. So when he came to a wrongful conviction case in Australia, he knew what questions to ask and that's the most important thing. So even, you know, I've talked to like lawyers or people around Rocky, they weren't, they still thought Kevin was guilty, but we've shown you know, swathes of evidence, but the first clues actually came from the river. So the river actually told us before we got any other information, we found out the title records didn't support the police version of events. In fact, they worked against it. So it was actually, that's why I talk about the river having the story and the river always knowing, because it was the river who told us straight away that Kevin was innocent. And so it wasn't even just the official, we didn't have trouble finding information. It was more about what were we actually looking for and what questions hadn't been posed before. And we were only able to do that through, you know, community connections through listening to black witnesses who'd been totally disregarded, but also through actually understanding, you know, Australia hasn't actually fully understood what's happening in relation to wrongful convictions, the way the justice system are treating black women as victims, but black men as perpetrators. So you had to look at it in a completely different way to the way the white courts were looking at it. They're looking at Linda as basically this body when she wasn't, you know, she was worthy of justice. She had a whole community. They were focusing just on her wounds, not on her whole personhood. And then they were seeing um, the space on the riverbank as this violent space in which black fellows inhabited and a front to white respectable society. Fundamentally they were seeing um, black men, particularly Kevin, as just a savage animal perpetrator, you know? So we're looking at it through different eyes than what the, you know, racist, violent colonial court is looking at it. And that was the first thing. So it's, the information is there, it's just you have to look at it through the eyes of black followers, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I did. Uh, hi, I'm Judy Alexander and I'm a white fella, um, work for the Australian Council of Education. So, uh, I originally started as a geologist and I was working in Western Australia. Actually, I don't know whose land I was working on, but I was working in Canberra and, um, and I was looking for the structural geology of uh, inner gold mine. And I sort of was like numbing it out with the people I was with who weren't researchers at all. And, and we're having this big talk and all these bourbons and how, what if the fault went this way and that way and what if there were these other sub faults coming off the two main faults. And it had, you know, possibly a bit of a bourbon filled revelation. Walked out of the room and in the sky the clouds had exactly the, the thing that I'd just been talking about in the clouds. And I was like, it's true, the clouds are telling me that that's the fault <laughs> orientation and I never spoke about it to anyone else in geology and I didn't mention it in my thesis and I didn't tell my supervisor. And I think what I get excited about when I listen to Indigenous people talking about the land told me where the thing was is um, I think there's a lot of uh, people who are not Indigenous who are hiding what the land tells us and hiding our relationships and that we, we don't actually want to sit down and have an agenda and get to an end point in every single discussion in our workplaces that we actually yarn a lot in our own non-Indigenous way, but we do some sort of analogue, we do a lot of chatting, and then we come into work and go, I must be business-like, and wear my business clothes. And, and I feel like there's a huge appetite for non-Indigenous Australians to, or non-Indigenous people to come up alongside Indigenous people. Is that 
really dumb or is that, that's <laughs> what was, but is that a really unrealistic way of looking at the future or is that something that we could get to but if it wasn't full of microaggressions and all the stuff that we're currently mm. doing wrong so, I mean, I think, I, I mean, if we can yarn about with those coincidences and uh, we had some yarns about Amy and I'm not sure if this is part of the PhD. Um, I'm not sure, you know, and so as blackfellas coming to these institutions, we're still working out what comes in and what stays out and what's Canada's knowledge and what's legitimate and what's not. Even just my reluctance to name it, because I'm like, white people aren't going to understand this. They're going to think I'm crazy, you know what I mean? <laughs> but then just realising, no, well, it was almost like the sign, if I was staying away, they would come to, you know, I, I don't know how to explain it. It's stuff like um, my dad's connection to the case and then a couple of weeks after I'd get a random phone uh, message from the last person who saw Queenie alive. And then finding out um, like months later that the house that we work out of in Will and Gabba, in, what's it called, Institution Comfort <laughs> of Race Research, Research, was the place Queenie would go when she was in Brisbane. You know, all the houses in Brisbane, all of these, the connections it has to so many other things that I'm just finding out now. You know, it's these sort of things. House, and it's just like, this, having this conversation. yeah, it's things like that you can't deny it. But at the same time, we're still figuring out what is, you know, and, like, and, and, and how to term it and how to understand it. and Because not everything needs to come, be brought in. Um, it can exist without it having to be named and claimed in this space. Um, so I'm not sure how white fellas handle that. We're still working out how what how we do that kind of stuff and what, what comes in. But I think we do need to um, all be challenged about what, what is considered knowledge um, and, and who gets to be the authority on that. Um, and to be more inclusive the idea that there are knowledges that exist out there that we may not be trained to understand or make sense of, but it exists. Um, and so how you find a place for that um, is, we all sort of have to find how to navigate that, our ethics around that stuff, but the, the acceptance that this is knowledge. Mm. It's, it's not a mental illness. Um, it's not an <laughs> illusion. It's real it's, and it's real knowledge. Um, and mob will tell you about them anyway. Like yes. <laughs> you sit around with mob, they'll tell you a million different things that have happened. You know what I mean? Like all of these, these signs that we've lab labeled them different things and we interpret them in different ways, but all mob will talk about it, you know? So it's not even that it's me again, like the word discovering or bringing it into the academy. It's stuff that's happening in community every single day. Like any mob are going to tell you about it, you know what I mean? And off, yeah, it's not the, the, the discovery to claim, it's an affirmation of who we are and where we come from and what this place is, how this place is speaking. So sometimes it just needs to stay, mm. um, but it's a reminder of our connection to this place. Um, and that in itself, if, if um, you know, I've, as working in, in health and, and studying Indigenous health, um, I, I, I came to health at like 17 years of age when I first started uni and I was surprised to discover how sick we were as a people because I didn't know we were really sick. Um, I didn't know there was something wrong with us. And so um, it was a, a shock to me to realise how bad we were as a people because <laughs> I didn't know that growing up in my house. Um, and so um, I realised that um, in health I was trained to, it, there, was a, there was a dispossessing function of the health sciences and the knowledge is produced about me. Um, and so what's really nourishing for me as a black fellow when we recognise all of our knowledges, there's something really um, grounding, nourishing, um, in, in being reminded of who we are and where we come from, that this racialized imagining of, of us is actually, that's the, that's the illusion, that's the, that's the mental illness. Um, and so as blackfellas, that situation you're in, we are walking in and out of that every day, from this campus to Anala, to the, all these, constantly walking between that, these, these, um, uh, th this conflict, I guess, and around knowledge. Um, and the fact that we're here still doing the work is a testament to the, to the strength of Indigenous intellectual sovereignty, the, the power of it, that we can move and be and know who we are and where we come from, despite the stories that they tell of us. For me, that's always been the difference between um, moving in these spaces as an Indigenous academic and between non-Indigenous people, ways of being, doing and knowing. And I know people think it's academic wankery to use words like ontology and epistemology and axiology, but when you actually drill into those concepts and talk about how we know, um, the way we are, the ways in our being, the way we do things, 
Um, that has always distinguished the work that I've done with Indigenous people and working alongside non-Indigenous people. Um, and I certainly don't have an answer to your question, but I think it is in the ways of knowing um, that does distinguish what we're doing in Indigenous spaces to non-Indigenous spaces. And I think um, it would, yeah, it's something that non-Indigenous academics, coming back to that other question, could really explore a little bit more, not trying to understand what we know and how we know, but just accepting that we do know in different ways. First of all, congratulations. I follow the four of you online immensely. And um, Dr. Mang, you're so, you're very funny. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> she may not have your reply to Yeah, right. yeah, right. My, my daughter's... <laughs> inbox to come out. <laughs> my daughter's sitting over there going, what are they talking about? <laughs> <laughs> what does she do? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, what do you say? I've come across many um, white folk who will, who will argue black and blue that social media isn't um, a place for change making. Um, that will argue that mm -hmm. uh, it's a waste of time and that um, people put too much stuff out there. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, Amy, congratulations on, on that work that you did with Annie Queenie, but um, what you did in that was, a, like, honestly, it was amazing. And um, the way that you, you wrote about it and the way that I read it, I felt safe as a Waka Waka man reading about a Waka Waka mm -hmm. woman who was uh, murdered on, on your country and brought back um, home. Um, we know that change can happen. Why do you think many white folk um, are so against social media, or, or at least this knowledge of black fellas, you know, staunching up on it? I don't know, but I think one of the things is like establish, establishment media have always been had trouble with actually dealing with social media. But as I think we were saying before, like Blackfellas have just taken it and used it for its own. And I was just thinking when you're talking about that, is you know when um, that that court case come out um, around Elijah Doherty over in WA and that killer who killed him got like three years and then was basically allowed to walk free. You know, the outpouring of grief, yeah, the outpouring of grief but the um, assertion that he was worth something and that he was, um, you know, worth so much more than the white justice system's accommodation of justice you know what I mean like I think that outpouring of grief that outpouring of mourning actually showing that the lives of black children the lives of Elijah Doherty was valuable acknowledging that you know he wasn't a criminal he wasn't doing anything more than riding his bike along the street in Kalgoorlie understanding and affirming the community and the family's knowledge that this was racist and this was racist violence even if the courts didn't that was important, you know, even if it was on social media, it did lead to protests. It didn't lead to any further outcome in the courts, but just that outpouring of expression that Elijah was worthy of justice when the courts had said, no, he wasn't. I think that's a huge and powerful way that black fellows are using social media in ways that white fellows just don't understand and the establishment media don't understand. Because when I see like those debates around, you know, um, trolling and cyberbullying of high profile, like people on six figure incomes and all this stuff acting like they're the victims, I just think because my career started with the NT intervention, which was driven by the media, complete lies about the communities of Wadair and Mutajulu, um, and lies about Aboriginal men being pedophiles across Northern Territory and across Australia, the media has been violent to us. So social media has been a way to contest that violence. And I think that's how mob have used it, but fundamentally we've used it to assert the worth of our people, to say, you know, um, our children, our men, our women are worth something. And that's what we're doing right now. And I see that every day when a court, when JC, you know, the, we're seeing in the courts, you know, how they're deeming Aboriginal life as worthless every single day, how they're uplifting, you know, the police and the cops as, you know, these were, they were just protectors. Oh, it was just a mistake. Oh, she was a threat. Well, she wasn't a threat. You know, so that's how we're using social media to contest that, but also to show that black fellas are valuable and we're, we're mourning for them. And I think that's important. And it's led to connections with mob over in WA. When um, Kuman J Walker was killed in Uindamu, we knew that night because mob were live streaming outside the police station. Everyone knew by the morning that the cop in w NT had killed an Aboriginal boy in Uindamu. You know, so it's, it's breaking down. We, we're connected in so many ways that maybe we weren't before. And I think we're using it in very, very special ways that, you know, as I said, mainstream media limited debate because they see it as a threat because we're using it in a way that is threatening to them. Yeah. And so I think that's why they're so totally closed off to um, actually the power of it. I mean, central dispossession is dispersing the natives. 
Um, it's always been a strategy and, and an effective one. And what I love, if you look at the protection era of you know um, removing blackfellas off onto land and into mission reserve communities, the richest of communities have been created in the most horrific places. Um, so you think of the beauty of, of black mission communities. Um, we, in, and, and again, in online spaces, we're creating the sense of community and connection that we've always had as blackfellas. And we find ways to do it in the most tragic of circumstances, but it speaks to the, the power of our connection. It's real, because we come from this place. And, and as blackfellas across this continent, we are all connected to each other, always have been. And we're just seeing that continue to being reproduced no matter what the context of, of us recreating a sense of community, whether it's has traditionally historical or contemporary context, because community has always been about who we are as a people, not as individuals, but as a community. And, and that's, I think, in terms of um, the research space around digital media, there's an opportunity to reimagine Indigenous presence in, in online spaces, not as one of inclusion and access, but to really think about how community gets created um, and the power of that, those communities um, in these various spaces and what happens. If we, if we accept that blackfellas have power first and foremost, then maybe we might ask some of those nice questions about that. I think what, what I really love is um, the, the way that we show love to each other. And I think that underpins how we engage on, you know, whether it's Facebook, talking with aunties, or organising events in our communities, or you know, just you know, hashtags that everyone starts to use, or the live streams that come in from communities when there is there's been an issue or something like that. Like all of that is underpinned by love. Like there's there's no other way to explain that kind of power that it has um, to reach and for us to be able to connect. Like it is. It's just that's what black fellas do to show love because. The system doesn't show love, you know, the dominant culture doesn't show us love, but we can use those tools to actually show love for each other. And especially when it comes to our children and to show that they are, you know, they, they are worthy. Like Amy said, they are worthy, even if the justice system or the school system or some, you know, they don't believe in it. Mm. I do wonder if it's their failure to be able to regulate us on Twitter is the thing that they hate the most about us. <laughs> so True. I think that's probably a real thing. And something is just about love. Something my daughter says to me, because she's been to a few protests in a day, and she says to me, Mum, how come the white protests, they don't know how to protest? <laughs> True. How come they never seem to get people there? How come they never have the right slogan? They have a slogan, you know, 15 words long. Yeah. And it's kind of like... They just need to watch Black Lives, you watch Twitter. We know how to organise to get everyone there, to get them all saying the same thing, <laughs> the same place, sort of thing. But not always on time. But the words are there. They don't know how to do it. Black fellas know how to use True. Our Facebook and Twitter. We know how to kind of use that to get all our mob in one place. And that's something that, you know, she says, white fellas just don't seem to have figured out yet. And I think <coughs> that because we can use that, that's something that mm. I like about us. Mm. Yeah. Um, do you have any other questions? Do you have time? Yeah, we have time. Um, I was going to say, Chelsea spoke a lot about, um, you know, people having or speaking um, challenging ideas and new knowledge and things like that. Um, and I feel like that's often, you know, sort of co-opted for, like, um, by, like, I should be able to say really racist things and to argue those or whatever. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm curious about how, as sort of in classrooms and as teachers in that space, you navigate sort of keeping safety, particularly for, like, black students, against that sort of rubbish and how you sort of um, I mean, and it's something I have to keep myself in check too, because um, this is about power and speaking truth to power. So um, my thing is always about punching up, um, and so you know, blackfellow Twitter will rag if we need to on things, but that's because we're punching up, not punching down. Um, and so it's something I have to check as well. Um, I get in trouble because, um, and I think a lot of black women do who have either a verified or have a following. The the black woman with the platform. The disdain in which that gets articulated is something something in itself. So there are times where I might be speaking truth to power, but I'm then framed as a bully because I'm using my platform apparently, um, and I'm I'm just at home with five kids trying to, you know, 
do some th like it's it's um, um, I, I, I'm not that well organized in some respects to some of the, the that stuff. But um, for me, my own ethics is um, and there. Look, I've got lots of drafts in my on my in my Twitter, so you don't, haven't heard the worst of it. Um, <laughs> just saying. Um, <laughs> It's a mess. Um, but uh, so, you know, um, I have to regulate what I do. I have to think about, oh, is this okay? And I do have close friends who go, mm, too far. Um, and I have good friends who sometimes say, yeah, no, nah, just keep it in drafts. Um, so I think we all have a responsibility to think about what we're doing. And my, my question is, am I punching up or down? Um, I never want to be have an online presence that involves punching down. Um, and so I encourage people to think about that, that um, there's nothing there's nothing courageous or joyful about doing that um, and and these these platforms are the opportunity for us to speak truth to power and that's how how we should be using them um, but yeah there are people who think that um, access means entitlement and um, ha haven't understood that there's you know as blackfellas we've always been raised like I just think about um, before you speak, what's your right to speak? Who, you know, what's your relationship with that knowledge? Who are you to be saying this? So we've always been checked on this stuff. So when we come to social media, it's just, we well, just behave how you're supposed to behave. We've always had to be checked on that. And we get called out in community if you're speaking about something you don't know nothing about or you don't have a proper connection to or whatever. So we've been trained in the ethics of, of this at our kitchen tables. It's not something we discover when we come to social media but we bring that, that way to social media. Um, but yeah, I always think, are you punching up or punching down? And then make that decision. Thank you for this. I feel like I've learned so much. Um, <clears throat> throughout this talk, um, I think you've all said a few times the ways that um, white academics can do better in terms of uh, recognizing different types of knowledges and that type of thing. Um, but my question relates a little bit more to um, time and collaborations, I guess. So um, I think there's a, a lot of people here like me who are really interested in learning more about Indigenous knowledges and, and perhaps working with Indigenous researchers, but there, there's many more of us than there are of you, and I imagine you get lots of requests to meet, or, and all of that takes up your time. So. Um, I, I guess I was wondering if, if there is something you wish that white academics knew or would do better in terms of um, seeking to collaborate with you in various ways. Resource it. Um, so if, if you want Indigenous expertise, that comes at a price, just like anyone else's expertise. So if you want to take an Indigenous academic from their day job, then okay, do a deal with some RA money um, where you can get strategic advice and we can still get our work done. Um, so think about how, how is it resourced first and foremost, just like we resource every aspect of our, of our research in terms of the study design, it has to be built into the, to the budget. Um, uh, I think, um, Oh, I should have that. Um, it is about relationship and meaningful relationships ones and it's about not accessorising but actually accepting that there's going to be a different way of doing things and taking that on board. Um, so it means having to redesign stuff because maybe we didn't get it right yet. Um, so not just accessorising research project with an Indigenous person as ancestry, um, a preparedness to engage meaningfully with Indigenous knowledges via their participation, um, getting an Indigenous person who has expertise in the area in which you're wanting to, to, to do. So not any Indigenous person will do for any research topic. We're beyond that now. Um, <laughs> Recognising that Indigenous knowledge holders may not be academics with PhDs, they may be someone in the community context um, and or work in non-government or somewhere else, but they have expertise and knowledge um, to bring to a research team. Um, be prepared to be accountable um, and to walk away from meetings going, oops, we got that wrong. We better fix it um, rather than how do we manage that black person. Um, the other thing is always get more than one black person. Don't make one person be the only black person at a table with a research team. It's too violent. We need someone else to roll eyes at with. <laughs> Help us out. <laughs> Good ways. Yeah, go. Mm. <laughs> Let's go for wine. Um, yeah. I think that's my quick off the top of the head. Yeah. Does anyone have any further questions of getting close to the end? Is that deep breath before you want to ask the question? <laughs> <laughs>
just a brief. Okay. Um, I think we might wrap it up there, but does anyone want anything, any takeaways you want people to get from the talk today? Follow Black Follow Twitter, Amplify, follow Black accounts, retweet Black accounts. You don't need to quote tweet them, apparently that's a thing. Um, amplify the knowledge. And if you if you learn something from um, Black Fellow Twitter, you can, you know, hyperlink the tweet or embed it in the conversation piece that you write about it, or you can cite it actually in the journal article. Um, there's, there's actually a way of citing tweets and stuff. Um, so uh, engage with it, but um, acknowledge th the source um, and just amplify. Um, and if you mess up, then just own up. It's, it's actually really easy to do. It's much easier than, yeah, the other stuff. To be fine with your own up, then if you double down, then that's, yes. that's the problem starting. Mm. Like, and just know we all get a turn, uh, black fellas too. So we yes. all. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So can we just thank our um, panel, Jess, Jess, uh, Amy, Chelsea, and my cousin Melinda here. <laughs> Thank you.